So this, uh, I'm going to start at the very beginning. So you started at ECS as the accounting supervisor in 1980. So were you like a numbers nerd or were you a science nerd? Like what got you started here? Uh, neither of those things. Um, and I was a business major uh, with actually pretty limited uh, accounting in my curriculum <laughs> that I studied. Did they know that? Uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure how much they knew about uh, my my accounting background, but they were comfortable with my liberal arts uh, college that I went to and uh, my business administration degree and um, then the limited experience I had, which was really just as an intern in the marketing department of a pharmaceutical company. And, uh, and so I probably had a good interview and uh, they were willing to give me an opportunity. So why, so they gave you the opportunity, why did you want to come here or was it the matter of? Yeah, so that was, I was really attracted to it, even though I, I wasn't uh, looking for an accounting job. I, I was looking for a, a position more in the marketing area, because that's, as I said, I had done an internship in that. And, uh, but the society uh, gave me an opportunity because of its size and the comprehensive nature of the position. I mean, it was accounting, but it was much more than that. And I also had aspirations to go on and get a master's degree. And at that time, and it's probably still the case, that there was, uh, to get into good schools, you, you, you were looking to get a couple of years of experience. And I thought, you know, this job at the ECS afforded me that opportunity. And it's interesting, too, because I, I wasn't so sure about that, uh, except after the first interview, it was clear that the job was going to be a great background, a great experience. But I still didn't know very much about the Electrochemical Society. And in those days when you were a job hunter, right, you couldn't find out anything. <laughs> there about was no it. internet to go <laughs> cruise. And so even after the interview and they explained it to me, I did not understand the true nature of this organization. But the, the position was, uh, was pretty clear and I, I thought, and, and it was a great opportunity for somebody coming out, out of school. And when you say size, you mean because it was small and you were going to get to do a lot of different things? That's right. Uh, the position involved, you know, my oversight of the investment portfolio, uh, uh, you know, obviously the, the basic accounting system, you know, and the reporting that's required. Uh, and there were two staff members, so, you know, you have accounts receivable, uh, the, the cash disbursements. Uh, so it was, it was re really comprehensive. And I worked directly for the executive director called executive secretary at that mm -hmm. time. So it was really um, a lot of experience in, in the general business administration of an organization. And it's, so you grew up, I, I found an interesting thing as I looked into it. So you grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. You undergrad in, in, at Lebanon Valley College, which is not far away from where we are now here in New Jersey. You did your master's of business ad, administration at uh, Ryder College, which is also nearby. Uh, all fairly local, mm -hmm. definitely in the same geographic area. Was that by design? And do you find it ironic that the job you finally have, all you do is travel around the world? <laughs> <laughs> There's, yes, so I, I find that ironic uh, because I was pretty much a local guy. Another piece of irony uh, is that um, my namesake, uh, my grandfather, who was an immigrant from Spain, when he came to this country, uh, he moved into an apartment complex that was about four blocks from where the ECS headquarters was at Lehigh University. <laughs> so <laughs> I had an early connection, so to speak. Yeah, I'll say. Um, but Lebanon Valley uh, was uh, primarily because I, I went there, I was a, a high school basketball player and had aspirations to play at college. And uh, my father was uh, the athletic director and football coach at that time at Moravian College. And I was familiar with the school and looking for a place to play. Uh, and, uh, and my father uh, felt that the school was a very good school. As I said earlier, it was a good liberal arts college. Not too far from home, uh, just a good place to land. And you didn't want to play for your dad? Is that <laughs> well, he didn't want you know. So my father was funny about the way he communicated things to me. And somehow in our, I, I knew it was a bad idea to go to Moravian College. He just wanted me to get out on my own and, and you know, succeed, fail, whatever happens, but to make that you know, for me uh, to do to do what I was going to do, and and disconnect from him and and his uh, college. Well, let's talk about your mom and dad for a second, because your your dad Rocco, right, uh, is in the Cornell Athletics Hall of Fame. He was a star quarterback. He was at Moravian, which is nearby in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was head football coach, uh, winningest coach in the school history. Um, not too long ago, the newly renovated Moravian College football stadium was named after him. So he was a big force mm -hmm. and must have been a big force in your life. Yeah, I, I 
wanted to go to Moravian College. <laughs> in fact, I grew up on the in the gym and on the fields at Moravian College. When I was old enough to hop on my bike, I had a key and I, you know, opened the college and used it for my own, you know, recreation facility. <laughs> I loved everything about it. Uh, and so, yeah, it was it was certainly a big influence in uh, in my life uh, and, and sports and and the whole you know college experience through through him and his coaching. Did you ever uh, consider following in his footsteps as, as opposed to business administration? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, again, as I said, my father had a way of communicating things to me. Uh, and, um, and he, uh, in his way, uh, suggested that, you know, I, I, that, that's fine. And it's a great career and, and, and all of that. But I think he wanted me to try something else, you know, something that he thought might be, you know, uh, had greater aspirations than... You know, which is a funny thing, to, you know. Because yeah, greater I, than having a stadium yeah, named Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I never fully understood it, but I could feel the push. And, I, you know, I trusted his judgment about those things and, and decided that I would, you know, pursue a, a career in, in business. And how did being an athlete affect, affect you, even to this day? Does that... Well, it, it's, it, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it affects even uh, my longevity at, at ECS. You know, it, the the idea of, of coaching really, it's not a direct connection to what I'm what I'm doing now at, at ECS, but, you know, sort of the, the, the discipline that, you know, I, I apply to my work, uh, the, um, uh, the sort of the, the loyalty to the institution and the team, and, and all those things are, are variables that are really important. And those, you know, my father's an old school football coach, you know, <laughs> and, and so, you know, team is first, and you run through the wall for the coach and, and all that kind of thing. And, and so, you know, those were values that really he instilled in me. Let's talk about your mom for a second. Your mom was, uh, or was a fifth grade um, teacher, mm -hmm. elementary school teacher. And I'll mention right here that you happen to marry a teacher. I'm not sure if that's a coincidence or not. Um, how was it being a son of an educator? That's like the opposite side from mm -hmm. the athletic mm -hmm. side. Well, uh, you know, so um, my mother, um, I, you know, was was a great teacher, and uh, and you know, through her, the, the appreciation and the value of education, you know, and <laughs> and the, the demands uh, of of you know, what you should invest in edu getting a good education. And I think also of uh, the lessons learned, uh, you know, how you learn. So, you know, both my parents being in the, the positions they were in, you know, there's one thing uh, that, uh, and I think this has helped me a lot, and I think it actually could help uh, younger generations of today, that, you know, I, I learned from my, my coaches and from my teachers because, um, I, I knew, uh, according to my parents, that they were always right, and that in order to succeed, I have to do what they require me to do, and not debate whether that was right or wrong or not, but and have the discipline to do that. And and I, it, has, it, w it was a good lesson because you're going to encounter teachers you don't like and coaches you don't like, and you you know you need to own your own success or failure, not blame it on the coach or or the teacher. And like I said, your your wife is a teacher. And you have two grown children, and I'm, I, I could do the math real fast, but uh, I, I don't even have to do the math. So your children only ever knew you having this job, and you they grew up with you, you know, being pretty much the executive director even of at, at ECS. Mm -hmm. What was the, how how did your family affect? Well, as much as anything, um, you know, my wife. Uh, I mean, starting with her was it was she she enabled what I was able to do here by being uh, a great mom. Uh, and then after our kids were old enough, she went back to work and and just uh, just her contributions to the family and support of me. And it, that, in a lot of cases, is very subtle. <laughs> Some of it's just tolerating, you know, the frustration when you deal with the challenges that you deal with. And sometimes maybe it's not even so subtle. It's just her carrying the ball, uh, uh, you know, and I, I think about you know the times of travel you were alluding to earlier, mm -hmm. you know when um, when I uh, before I became executive director and had uh, a lot of the responsibility for the program aspects of the meeting, uh, the organization, which the meetings and the publications. So um, very much in the way our director of public, uh, director of meetings has today, I, I would uh, when I I. My time at the meetings was lengthy. I, I would uh, go the Thursday before and stay and, and never leave before the Friday afterward because our programming would extend to Friday. That's nine days away. I had two young kids at home. She's all by herself. 
I remember an occasion where um, we met in San Diego, and a few of the staff members were staying on to go to the zoo, you know, and right. you're in San Diego. And right. So I spent the weekend there, you know, doing uh, some leisurely things in San Diego. <laughs> and that extended the trip to 11 days, and I had a hard time understanding why she was a little upset, you know, <laughs> when I came home. But I <laughs> learned to appreciate what it meant to be away, you know, from the family. And uh, she just handled things, and, and that really... Uh, help me, you know, uh, focus on, on doing what I'm doing. Uh, you know, getting back to my father, you know, I think she, I knew her in college. We met in college. Oh, at Lebanon Valley. Yeah. Oh. And I do have a tendency to throw myself, you know, into things. It's, you know, she knew, you know, there was going to be another wife in my life, where, whether it be the Electrochemical Society. It's just how I approach things and was willing to, you know, share that. And, and as I said, you know, handle the things that she, she needed to handle for our family. And, of course, my kids, you know, uh, it just, I'm very fortunate. I, I have two great kids. Uh, I got to share a lot of their life because I live close by, and and you know I can get to, to games and teacher conferences and things when I have to. And so even though the demands and the travel uh, took me away a lot, um, you know the whole family uh, being there and 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 my opportunities to be part of uh, what they were doing through my close proximity was just a, a you know it was something I really needed to you know to help me and fulfill my life and, and you know, and be happy and, and, and have a little balance, you know, between the, the work and the home. So, so back to work then for a second. So within two years of you getting here, you got named assistant executive secretary, which is basically the, the assistant to the top guy. And within 11 years, you succeeded uh, Bud Branicki as ECS's executive secretary. That was 1992. What role did Bud play in the whole thing? Because you spent a decent amount of years with him. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think ultimately, um, without his um, support and and really pushing, you know, for uh, the this, this succession for me to, you know, come to this role, I'm I'm not sure that it would have happened. And I think, you know, leading up to that, uh, you know, he. Uh, he gave me a great understanding of the mechanics of the organization, a great opportunity to uh, experience and working all parts of it and the different roles that I had. Uh, and so it was a level of training uh, and support that you know was extraordinary in, in preparing me uh, for this job. He also he also integrated me into the industry. So we're ECS, like uh, all the nonprofit associations, are part of a, a bigger industry of, of nonprofits. And so I became, through him, familiar with uh, the other associations and, and built a network. And, and he was a great facilitator of making that happen. And these are like the, not just other science, science organizations, but organizations that help Nonprofits, nonprofit societies. Well, it was mostly mostly uh, other scientific and engineering organizations through the Council of Engineering and Scientific Society Executives, which is a, a network of about 200 of them. And so I became very actively involved again through his um, uh, encouragement and support, and, um, and and built a really strong network. While before I was uh, executive secretary director. <laughs> so, so tell me, tell me how you got the job then, because he was preparing you. That's good. Mm -hmm but you still had to apply for the job. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so, uh, so that, um, uh, like, like a lot of people say about their careers, is you know, timing is everything. And, and timing was really critical. So he had, a, uh, he had an agreement with the organization, a, a pretty standard employment agreement, but it was five years that took him to retirement. So it was a five-year plan that they were working on the transition. So there was a lot of time to plan and, and they formed a search committee, and and you know so leading up to all of this, uh, there, you know I, I became a clear candidate, and that was that's the timing part of it. So the organization wanted to consider me, uh, and I had you know an opportunity to demonstrate you know what I could do for the organization, but um, you know I was pretty young. I when when I finally took over the role, I was only 33 years old. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a, a school of thinking that, you know, that more seasoning was necessary. And, um, and that, you know, you always have this, um, what, other, what else in the background might be important? So not coming from the technical community, you know, is going to raise, uh, you know, a question and uh, about the type of candidate they think they need to have now. Uh, do they value keeping me in the role as the assistant, you know, while they get a uh, more technical leader? And all those questions were being asked. And uh, so 
you know, again, timing is everything. The, this, the search committee that was formed was essentially the executive committee with two of the incoming officers. And through my work in ECS, I was able to get very close to uh, particularly three or four of them and talk to them, you know, before the interviews even started, you know, because yeah. they reached out to me. And so, you know, it, it, just a, a combination of uh, opportunity and, and then this level of support that was internal just enabled that to happen. And I feel very lucky uh, because I think without that good timing and, and that support, it, it wouldn't have. And do you remember how you found out about the job? Yeah, got? yeah. <laughs> um, well, so, I mean, about the job itself, they, so ultimately it led to an interview in front of the whole board of directors. And, um, and so I, I knew pretty much that, so that was at our uh, regular time board meeting. You know, I sat at some chair. And, like and, an in inquisition the, yeah, yeah, like yeah, at, at the top really of a U. Okay. I know. Yeah, yeah. 23 people asking questions. Yeah. And, um, and, and so uh, it was actually later on that afternoon, they, they didn't, you know, deliberate much further than, uh, you know, the afternoon afterward. Uh, and they, they had made a decision and I found out. And, um, and uh, it was in Montreal. And so someone let my wife know, and she, so she flew to Montreal. Oh, and then I, nice. I had dinner with um, just a few of the, the board members, the president, you know, the, some of the people that I was close to. They said, we want to, you know, go out and celebrate. And, and some, some of my peers found out, and, you know, I got a bottle of champagne and all those things <laughs> that night. So it was really, really special. It's why, you know, I held uh, Montreal uh, is, is close to my heart because of uh, that, that experience that happened there. Nice. That's great. So as you worked your way through the years then, especially in the beginning years, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, in the beginning, ECS was uh, populated by people from Bell Labs and from IBM and from industry, more so than it is, way more so than it is now, where it's more academic uh, focused. Um, but that must have been fascinating at a time where Bell Labs was Bell Labs and a time where IBM was IBM. How did that influence the society, mm -hmm. do you think, and how did it influence you? Yeah, that it was a it was a major influence. You know, I think, and in, in, even in terms of my uh, my being selected as uh, you know the executive director, uh, because the, uh, the particularly the Bell Labs influence, because they were close and there were so many people involved. I had really strong mentors, and um, it, even connected to my master's degree, uh, when I uh, I was here a couple of years, and I still had these aspirations to get the master's degree. And uh, so I spoke to, uh, of course, Peranike, but the secretary at the time was from Bell Laboratories and um, just, you know, ask about the possibility of getting some kind of uh, reimbursement for tuition. And they just jumped in on that program. Yeah, we're going to do this, this, and this. And, and you know, it was, it was clear that they were trying to help me succeed. They wanted to develop me as an employee. And I think that was a, a mentality and approach that you know, came from their environment at, at Bell Laboratories. And there were so many of them. You know, we had two former editors, you know, Barry Miller and Paul Cole came from uh, Bell Laboratories. You know, at the time I said our secretary I came here was from Bell Labs. That was Forrest Trumbor. And a very early treasurer was Bob Frankenthal, um, Dennis Turner. You know, I could just list the names. And again, our close proximity and and then, of course, my participation at the meetings and things, uh, I had a lot of exposure to those people who uh, w were actively mentoring me. And, and you know, when I got uh, to the, the point of having to be selected for this position, you know, their help in preparing me for that was really uh, one, of the, one of the keys. Did you work with any um, of, the, uh, of the people that went on to be famous for something? Or did you <laughs> were you exposed to... Uh, you know, well, yeah, I guess what degree of fame, you know, I, <laughs> you know, um, no slight on Paul Coles or any of the other guys, but you know, somebody that invented the transistor, you know, somebody like that. Well, you know, the, cl the closest person would be, you know, Gordon Moore. Uh, but I, I would say that, you know, uh, and certainly there's, there's no, um, so the type there was no mentoring of, of the type I just described with Gordon Moore, although there was a number of interactions you know, with uh, Gordon Moore over the, over the course of my time here. In fact, one of, one of the things about, uh, you know, that really attracted me to this organization, you know, staying power that it had was the, ver the first meeting that I went to, uh, Gordon Moore was a plenary speaker. 
And um, I didn't know who he was, I, but I knew who Intel was. I had actually had applied for a job there. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was an no up-and-coming company, right? Uh, and um, and uh, Moore was the speaker. And, uh, and because of my involvement in a meeting, whatever, I, you know, I got to learn, well, this is the guy who basically you know, is, is revolutionizing you know, the, the computer world through his company at Intel. And uh, it just, you know, gave me a certain respect uh, and want to, you know, participate in all the, these things going on here uh, that, you know, that, that came with knowing somebody who's that, that kind of influence. It's like meeting Bart Starr or somebody, <laughs> he's the first football player I could think of, but, or, or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar yeah. in your case, yeah, you're a yeah. basketball player. That's yeah. right. Yeah, no, I get that. Uh, did you get any, um, like, like what kind of uh, advice were you getting along the way? Did you get practical things that you remember forever now of, of, from these guys? Um, I mean, yes and no. You know, I, a, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the mentoring was really about, you know, understanding the mechanics of the organization. Mm -hmm. It was real practical stuff. Um, some of it was, uh, you know, as, as computers became, uh, you know, part of the tools. When I came here, we didn't, there wasn't a computer in the office except the sort of mini, they called them. It was like a modified mainframe that really just housed the membership data uh, with dumb terminals. You know, you could access the data and use it to print labels and various right. things. But, um, you know, as things evolved and we had to go to, you know, the desktop computers and then start to use the internet, it was really, um, you know, uh, practical in terms of how we would utilize these tools uh, for ECS. You, you were here when there, when publishing was all paper. Tell us a little bit about what that was like, and then how you made the transition. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> the journal uh, going to every member, a paper copy, landing in a mailbox or on your desk after delivery. Um, was a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> That's like a sales tool right it there. Is. It's like the ultimate sales tool. It's elegant. You page through it. Uh, we did such a terrific job too with uh, you know the editorial piece and then the, the whole composition, um, the stylists who worked on it. Boy, by the time you got that, you had a great piece of science that was beautifully written <laughs> in front of you every month, and and you had this sort of paper document you know, trophy to, to look through. Uh, put in your bookcase. Put in your bookcase. Uh, and so that, that was a great time. It, it, uh, we can do dissemination better the way we do it now, more broadly, more quickly. And all those things were necessary. I mean, those were goals we had then with paper, but there was something so elegant about the way the system worked with that. And, and it was just highly effective, as you were saying, as a sales piece. You know, retaining members and and uh, really it was before we had interface it was the face of the organization it was who we were the journal of the electrochemical society and our meetings were well known i don't want to diminish them at all but it just um it was so representative of the quality work that we were doing here and so how was it making the transition into the digital age tell me a little bit about that some of that that was rough that was bumpy uh, because you know it, there's there's so many unknowns and you have to make uh, investments you know in things uh, some will work some won't technology that was just developing as you right. were trying to use it right and you know whether your constituency is going to jump onto that technology and want to take advantage of it, they're going to push back um, and this is you know back to your uh, question earlier about you know the the early influence you know and and where you know they helped me uh, you know w w by the time we were making the transition to digital. I was the executive director, but the lessons learned early on about how to manage that within the organization is what I got from those folks. And, and, it, and it was tough. Uh, it was tough really even just getting lift off off the ground. You know, here's an idea, here's how we'd like to approach it. And you know, 10 committees have to digest it. You know, and then the finance committee says, not nah, too much money. <laughs> you know, kind of and, and just for the folks out there in TV land, um, just give an idea of what it was like before it was digital, like the process, it's mm -hmm. a short version, and then how that changed. Mm. Well, uh, one of the interesting things about the way we were functioning is that uh, our editor, our editor-in-chief, was off, uh, off-site 
So he was president of university, uh, Rice University. His name was Norman Hackerman. He was a legend. I was going to say very famous <laughs> as well. Famous. He had the job for 40 years. <laughs> uh, and he actually stepped down right when I stepped in as executive director. So I was very involved in the transition and getting the, the next way to do it, you know, the, the next version. They, they all, that came together. His, his stepping down and the, the process change where we began to use technology sort of happened simultaneously. Uh, but uh, so he he ran the editorial board from Rice University, and we paid uh, somebody on his staff to do that. And basically, manuscripts came in, paper copies. They came to this office. Uh, we would send uh, the manuscripts. Uh, we would send um, information about them to the editor, and he would decide uh, which uh, divisional editor would uh, you know handle handle that document. And then our staff would send it to them. And then the divisional editors would send it out for review, all by paper and mail. U.S. mail, yep. paper. Yeah. Yep. And then you know, uh, after six months, uh, we might be able to have a decision about it. And and then um, the uh, uh, the manuscript would uh, would come to us. Our stylists would go through it and create. Uh, you know, we used to use the ACS style manual, so there were certain, and, and how, how we presented the information was very important. The consistency of that, and so we had. Uh, a team on staff that would handle that, prepare it for composi composition, and we would send it to uh, Cummings Printing Company, who we still work with mm -hmm. since 1958, uh, <laughs> and they would they would uh, prepare it, uh, you know, the typesetting uh, for running it on their uh, their monster press that they used to print about 10, 12,000 copies. So, is it the move to digital that you would say had the most impact on the society during your time? I think there's no question about it because it goes to the the root of why we're here, to our mission, to disseminate information, to, to disseminate research, actually, uh, to advance the science. And so when you think about dissemination, what's happened with uh, digital information, what you can do with it, and then along comes Google and discovery, right, of digital information. <laughs> and the combination of those things are so powerful that we as an organization can do what we're supposed to do, what our mission says we're supposed to do, so much better uh, if we can make that transition and, and make that happen. And, and it's, it's revolutionary, really. Uh, and you know, it creates these huge opportunities for us. And it's just the, the, the challenge is um, you know, creating a scheme and a plan and, and, and an execution of using digital content and sharing it with our community. That's not so easy. <laughs> and again, you were on the forefront of that. You weren't going, oh, look what they did. Let's do that. You were like, we're going to make this up as we go along. Right? Well, you know, so well, this goes back to a few things we talked about. So my, my friends, uh, uh, a friend at, the, at CES, the Council of Scientific uh, Engineering and Scientific Society Executives, uh, made a presentation. Um, he was from the Astronomical Society. Give those guys a, a shout out because yeah. they were one of the physics organization right on the cusp. And I saw this presentation about, uh, the first time I had seen this, about true uh, abstract submission, uh, right? Uh, and like digital ads, no paper. No paper. Okay. And, uh, and so um, after the talk, I said, we got to learn more. He invited me down to Washington, DC. I went down there with our director of meetings. And uh, they did a demo for us. And <laughs> we said, I got to have one of those. <laughs> And so we, we, we hired their consultant who <laughs> built the thing, and he built one for us. And, um, you know, that was after a process of, you know, presenting to uh, the board of directors of how we'd go about it and the timing and so on and so forth. But that was, we, uh, we committed to it and built it in 95 for the first use of a meeting in, in 1996. And it, that one took off immediately, and, and that was the start of it. So, yeah, we, we jumped on it. I, you know, I saw the opportunity and the necessity of, of getting into that game. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's where we started. Now, it's a whole lot different now. Uh, because back then, uh, you know, simultaneously we're, we were building a website. <laughs> right. ECS didn't have one. And understanding how the internet, you know, can facilitate all of this. Uh, and, and so there was, a, there was a lot going on. And then, as I earlier said, so you take us out to, you know, where we are now. And not only do you have the, the technology to digitize and 
um, and then submission technologies, and, and then now we've kind of figured out how to use the internet, right? <laughs> is, you know, along comes this issue of discoverability of this information, and how if you compose it correctly, uh, how available and discoverable it, it can become. And that was, you know, that the, the final uh, a uh, great step, you know, for what we were trying to do with our mission. And again, the question is how, how do we as an organization make that happen for our content? And was there any pushback from that or did people embrace it? People embrace it, you know, in terms of uh, the possibilities and, and what, what you can accomplish through it. Uh, the, the leadership uh, has uh, a certain risk aversion because of the investment and the change associated with that. You have to change process. You have to make investments in technology. Uh, there's a lot of more competition in everybody's space because, you, you know, the technology facilitates the ability to be able to do this and and so you have a lot more players in the game uh, a lot more on the commercial side uh, and so you know where you fit into all of this and will you maintain your your member and author loyalty through it you know are you offering them the right services are you planning to do this the right way are you pricing it the right way uh, uh, you know those those questions make it very challenging for an organization who's built around a series of committees and board decision making to a consensus yeah. to <laughs> arrive at conclusions quickly while the revolution is going on. Right. And, that, and speaking of the revolution, right now the, the society is at sort of this nexus of things that are important to the world as far as sustainability goes, as far as people go. Um, was there ever a time where the society wasn't as significant? Was there, like in your, in your tenure, was there like a low time? No, I, you know, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I, I think what's happened um, both with technology and, um, you know, the, so the the ability to share the information combined with what's what's happening in the world around our science. So, you know, our connections to renewable energy primarily, water sanitation, but but communications and transportation, a whole series of things, um, are are higher profile and, and there's a greater sharing of this type of information and concerns about our future, right? And our, our science, you know, now has uh, these, these visible connections. And I don't think that visibility existed as much before, starting with that. And so um, I think it was always there. I just think it's, it's just, uh, just a more visible uh, a connection of the importance of our science. I, I mean, I already said that, you know, at our first meeting we had Gordon Moore making a plenary session, right? So what you know, could be more profound, right? Then here's the guy that, you know, created the law that basically led research to, um, well, not research, but computer technology. Yeah, yeah to take the a, risk. a place where I can put on my phone, you know, uh, my phone's a, a computer. I mean, this is a guy that did this. And so it was pretty profound, pretty relevant, you know, back then when I started. But I do, I do think there is a difference now caused by the things that I just mentioned. All right, let's talk about the meeting for a second. So you've been here as we record this for about 37 years. We, the ECS has two meetings a year. We call them our biannual meetings, spring and fall. I think that's 75 meetings you've been to. And we should give your wife a little credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> should give her a lot of credit for that. She's been to a few of them too. <laughs> so with all those meetings, there must be at least a couple good road stories, like you're on the road, there's stuff happens on the road. So I'm gonna start you off with one, right, which I think is a good story because over the time I've been here with you guys, um, you've told me some stories. And, and one that I love is the story about Rudy Marcus. So tell us, tell us about the Rudy Marcus story at a meeting. That one I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, and you talk about earlier, your question about how, um, you know, things now are, seem to be so relevant, so, you know, the, the science so important and so much happening in that area. And this is in 1992, right? So um, I'm uh, early on in, as executive director. And sure enough, one of our, our members who's giving a presentation at our meeting in Toronto uh, is selected to win the Nobel Prize. And I get the call because they're the, uh, the Swedish Academy of Science, who I believe gives the award, was trying to track him down. So you got a call from Sweden. I got a call. Okay. And uh, I was very busy at the meeting, as we all are, and um, they were insistent. They, they got me to a phone where I pretty much told them, uh, you know, I'm not a messenger service, uh, you know. <laughs> Wait, did they tell you who they were? <laughs> no, they told me who they were, but they weren't, uh, they were very elusive because uh, they didn't want, 
they, uh, for, I think for legal uh, issues, they, they cannot or do not want to uh, tell me why they're calling. They want to speak directly to the award winner first and foremost. And so they pretty much had to tell me that, uh, otherwise I was going to hang up on them and say I, I can't help them at the moment. And so, um, so anyway, they, they did their best to uh, tell me it was pretty important and there might be something that this person wants to know, remember who we are kind of thing, and I'm calling for help in the background. <laughs> who are, you know? It didn't, didn't hit me right away. I had a million things I was thinking about the meeting. And, um, and so I called our president uh, and said, let's go get him. And we knew what session he was in because he was given a paper that morning they called. And so we walked into the session and uh, we yanked him out of the session and he thought somebody, you know, was in a car accident somebody or died, something. Yeah, because yeah. we can't tell. No, so now, now I've been committed to be quiet about why we're calling. And so they're on hold from Sweden. We're running around. And you're like, you have to come to the phone, but I can't tell you why. Right, right. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It was awful for him. And so, but then we got him to the phone and, and you know, and uh, news of, every, I think everybody in the room except him know, knew why we were you know, coming to get him. Uh, they had anticipated that he was going to win uh, the Nobel Prize. And, but and they didn't know when he was going to find out. Right. Like he didn't know. He wasn't expecting it at the meeting. No. And so, and that's, you know, then the press comes and we have a big celebration and it was just unbelievable experience. You know, all of a sudden we have all this fame and glory at one of our meetings <laughs> and one of our attendees is a rock star. I mean, he just was signing autographs and programs and, uh, and it, it was very special and for him to be there with us. And he was such a humble man. Um, they had an impromptu press uh, conference because we were in Canada. He was a Canadian citizen. And so the, the press corps in Canada was just enamored with all of this. Uh, couldn't get enough of one of their, their homegrown uh, sons, you know, uh, winning this prize. And, uh, and so just being part of all of that was, was so enjoyable. And we moved uh, Marcus to the president's suite and, and, you know, shared time with him there during all of this. And, and it just was really special for me to be part of that. That's cool. Well, let's go to the other end, the other end of the spectrum then is in, in May of 1989, 175th ECS meeting, there was a session called, I have to read it, Electrochemically Induced Nuclear Fission Deuterium. That was the name of the session. It was given by two ECS members. The talk was given by two ECS members. Um, one of them was uh, from the University of Utah, which was Marty Fleischman, and then Stanley Pons. And what we're talking about is their uh, insistence on the discovery of cold fusion or the, the, the uh, actuating of cold fusion, which is a, a nuclear reaction that occurs at or near room temperature. So you don't need mm -hmm. a big ex atomic explosion to make it happen. And that, that's like a, a power, an unlimited power source. And I did some reading up on this. And it, so this was in May of 89. They had um, announced their findings in March so, I, and we all know that cold fusion didn't happen. And so how did, so you must have planned this talk somewhere between March and May. So tell me, tell me the story of how these guys ended up at the meeting and then the follow-up from that. That's right. It, it, it happened, it happened uh, in such a t short time frame. So first of all, uh, they were both card-carrying electrochemists. And uh, Martin Fleischmann, was, I mean, deeply involved in the organization. I mean, the year before uh, he came up with cold fusion, he won our own Palladium Award. <laughs> he joked that he used the Palladium in the experiment. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, and he may have, I don't know, because the experiment included Palladium. Um, and, um, and so he, we had easy access to him. Uh, and one of our officers called him and said, would he, you know, speak at the meeting? We'll put an impromptu session together. And he was like, sure. <laughs> and, now, and that started, uh, started such a big uh, event. Uh, you know, you talk about rock stars. Uh, we had to hire a team of uh, Wells Fargo security just to get him in the door. Because uh, as soon as uh, it became, we made it public, you know, they're coming to speak at our meeting. You know, the press corps was, was all over this. And scientists from all over the place now were coming to our meeting. And so we're like, okay, they can come. They have to register, including the press corps. <laughs> that didn't go over very big. <laughs> they had to pay the fee. They want to get in the session. <laughs> okay. 
Mr. Branicky uh, insisted. <laughs> and so we actually got criticized in the LA Times for that move. But anyway, I thought we were right to do that as well. So why not? You know, uh, look, this is our private meeting and they're, uh, they're, they're welcome to attend as long as they uh, register for the meeting. And so we had, we had a session uh, with... Uh, Pons and Fleischman. And how and many people? Do you remember how many people were there? Yeah, I've, you know, a couple of thousand. I'm sure you had to change the room. Whatever room yeah, you were originally right, playing, you right, had to move the room. Right. It, it, it was huge. Uh, I mean, we we expected something big, but we didn't expect Tom Brokaw to call us, you know, from NBC <laughs> Nightly News <laughs> and say he's sending somebody, you know. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, but, you know, their claims were, you know, they were on the cover of Time Magazine, these guys. And, you know, what they were talking about do, doing, uh, they were able to do, was would have changed the world, of course, you know, and, uh, and so it was a big deal. And the, the, both of these men had phenomenal credibility, and for them to put it out there and said, yeah, we'll do a session on this, this was a big thing. Yeah. Um, I understand they did one at ACS uh, as well, and so they were making the circuit, uh, sort of selling their idea. Uh, and sharing, you know, some of the results with the scientific community, and you know, that gave them, as I said, credibility in, in all of this. Um, and so it was quite an experience for ECS. And what happened was, uh, people couldn't reproduce it. But That's that, right. that, that was the downside. And some of that happened between March and May. Like by the time you had mm -hmm. it, there was always there was mm -hmm. already some negativity about. Oh, Is yeah. that right? Yes, uh, we we had to. Uh, really filter what our position was, what, whether we were going to do a publication, even ask for a publication. I think the, uh, well, I know that the, the society leadership was on, was on top of that. And we had some pretty, pretty bright people, too. Uh, and they were saying they just haven't seen enough, uh, you know, to want to push us out and, 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 and really publicize this information as part of our scientific content, whether that be a you know, uh, like a proceedings uh, publication or a journal publication. There was really no interest in that because of the things you just said. And I, I know just from doing a little bit of research, it was still another 10 years that experiments for cold fusion were funded in a pretty big way in different places, especially at uh, University yeah. of Utah, that it took, you know, that long for people. So it wasn't like fly by night. It was like, maybe this will work. And people wanted it to work, I guess, too. Yeah, and my best interpretation of all of that is, uh, you know, first of all, uh, again, uh, who those scientists were that were promoting this. Uh, you know, and I, I think, secondly, there was something interesting going on in their experiment that uh, really drove people to want to try and replicate it, want to, you know, hop in, see what we can get out of it, you know, kind of thing. And you, you saw a, a, a lot of different laboratories, you know, all over the world trying to hop in. And I understand it ruined some careers, too, as, as some very credible scientists, you know, pursued this. Uh, at the expense of their own reputations, and and they were, they, were, they were somewhat tarnished, and so it's really it's really quite a story. Yeah, and there's still a cold fusion group out there today. I mean, it's still there's yeah, still people yeah. looking into it, yeah. trying to make it work. Now, so in uh, 19, uh, 1980, when you uh, got to ECS, um, speaking of meetings, uh, there was about 15. Um, from outside the country, it's about 15% of the membership and people coming to your meetings. Um, and now it's closer to 50%. How did that happen? Did that, is that, was that something that planned or just something that happened organically? Both. Uh, the, um, I think that the scientific uh, discipline, um, you, you know, ECS, we were talking about this earlier, had, had such a strength in some of the big laboratories in the United States. You know, you had Bell Laboratories and IBM were dominant. Um, right around the corner from us was RCA, mm -hmm. General Electric, Intel, <laughs> Honeywell, Texas Instrument. I hate to keep naming them. I'm going to miss, you know, some important right. ones. But they, they were such a powerful influence. And, and the ECS, or excuse me, the, the U.S. dominance, you know, in, with those laboratories, I think made us more U.S.-centric. Although you, you have to give this organization a lot of a credit for understanding that there was a lot of good electrochemistry being done all over the world. You know, I always talk about in, in my presentations our organization changing the name in 1930, removing American, because they recognized that early the important contributions that were going on. I just think as, uh, as the industry evolved, uh, so much more of the great work was being done in Asia and Europe primarily, that it, that was the organic piece. And then uh, simultaneously, we, we started working on um, 
collaborative meetings, joint meetings and events that would facilitate participation beyond the U.S. better than what we can do. And, and that became a big part of our program area. And also we started to uh, create opportunities for leadership to come from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I've personally worked for four presidents uh, that are non-U.S. And so all of these things be begin to happen and, and uh, that you know, it just uh, working together, they just create this broader international participation, which is what it should be and, and needs to be for the success of the organization. And it, it wasn't always smooth, though, right? Because uh, what, what's the stories that you've told me um, that, the, the, uh, without naming any names, the, 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 the Brits thought your lack of coffee breaks were barbaric. Um, the Japanese, when you were working with them at some point, now you have to tell the story because you were working on a joint project. And you, right. and you thought negotiations were going well, and tell the rest of yeah, the story. Well, so that, uh, that's something, that, again, the organization was very uh, smart in, in terms of uh, just de developing collaborations with international constituents, wherever they may come from, and this one is in Japan. And we put together what we now call PRIME. It was a joint international meeting between uh, organization in Japan um, and uh, ECS. And, um, and so we had done it a few times, and I, I went to Japan with our president to talk to them. Uh, and the, the main topic was the revenue sharing, because uh, the meeting has become financially very successful, and what made sense. And it, it's very difficult because, you know, to divide revenue based on what formula is really the question. Not, not you know, and I, I, again, I, this is one of the great respects I have for our community in general, but particularly the Japanese. It, it wasn't so much, uh, you know, how much, but what, what's an appropriate way to determine, you know, how you receive, you know, the, the amount of revenue you, you receive from this, uh, this meeting event, if there is any surplus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. And so uh, I went there with our president to, you know, to talk to them about the, the meeting in general, but that piece of it, and had a really good scheme, at least I thought I did. <laughs> and so we had this very formal meeting in Tokyo. It was a very long formal meeting in Tokyo with lots of questions. And, um, and so uh, and so I was the... I created the formula. I thought I nailed it, you know. And we walked out of the meeting. My president and I were high fiving, you know. <laughs> this was great, you know. We're we're all on board now, and and so. But we stayed on in Japan as the guests of uh, a few of their own leaders who took us to Hakone, uh and the hot springs there. And so we shared some time together uh, in a condominium and and did some touring. And the I guess the it was the first night we were there, and we went to the hot springs. And we're sitting around, you know, naked in the hot springs, <laughs> towels on our heads because of the moisture is dripping all over the place. And, um, and so they bring up the, the meeting and, uh, and telling us that it was, you know, a great meeting in Tokyo. And they're glad they're here because we still need many discussions <laughs> about what we discussed in Tokyo. And, uh, and so... We, I, the president and I, it was Dale Hall, we looked at each other and it's like, didn't we conclude this? Uh, I thought we wrapped this up. We, you know, we nailed it. But, uh, you know, but apparently they still had more questions. And the, form, the formal meeting, I guess, is not where you solve all those things uh, in, um, in their culture. And so we solved them in the hot springs. And we solved them. We, we left uh, Halcone with a plan. And, and speaking of that, you, you had, uh, this is going to go to uh, the European groups that you dealt with. Um, you had one mentor who gave you some advice about how to deal, who was a European, who gave you some advice about how to deal with fellow Europeans. I wonder if you can tell yeah. that story. Because... I probably can't <laughs> without uh, <laughs> risking offending certain nationalities. <laughs> but let me just say it was very insightful. And This is uh, Bruno. Bruno Scrisati. Yeah, he, he was, was former, pre He was president at the yeah. time. Yeah. And it, I mean, it is a true story. He, he, he explained to me how to navigate Europe, <laughs> which basically he explained is you don't. <laughs> There's many different cultures and you just have, have to accept things for what they are. Uh, and one of the reasons it even came up is because he and I were traveling in Europe uh, as part of the Centennial Campaign and just visiting different organizations. Uh, and he was so, he was revered there. I mean, people respected him, liked him. I had such a great time. Uh, and we had already done a lot of work with um, uh, some different European constituencies, uh, a joint meeting with ISC, for example. 
and and so uh, we had and we had challenges navigating, you know what, um, you know making it work, you know what, how does a collaboration work, and um, and uh, you know in in so many ways he he told me there's very difficult cultural challenges, you know don't expect to make everybody happy, <laughs> don't expect everybody to like you, you know it doesn't work that way, you know, uh, and it's a constant negotiation here, you know and. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, that was that was a lesson enough. Now he told me some specific things about certain parts, you know, that uh, I, I don't want to we'll, share. We'll again. save that for the yeah. Blu-ray DVD. But uh, it was it was great the way he, uh, you know, he shared, you know, his his insights. And we we actually on, as part of that trip we visited Vittorio De Nora, uh, and and to see if uh, he was uh, interested in supporting the campaign, and getting to know him better, and and you know just to. Uh, I know we spent some time actually profiling him in Interface, and, and anyway, it was all part of that. And um, so it's just, it just was great seeing him interact with one of our greatest scientists. You talk about a legend, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so collaboration relationships, that seems to be a theme for, for you. Is it, is it something that you think this job is, is, is key to this job, and is it something that's key to mm -hmm. you, for you? It is, and it goes. I think about your dad again, and about yeah. the team and everything. Yeah, yeah. It, it is funny how I ended up. You said this earlier because you know, coming out of uh, Lebanon Valley College, you know, I was just. Uh, I hadn't been to too many places, you know. I was from uh, Bethlehem, a steel town, you know, primarily a blue collar place, and went to the Jersey Shore every summer. You know, that was my my travel experience, and then I come here, and um, I have this exposure to this enormously international organization and then you know to take the next step to, to create these collaborations and which have been so effective for us you know uh, that just uh, you know I mentioned uh, Prime because it's been sort of our feature and, and where we started but uh, you know now we're doing this in Latin America we call it AIMS but we've done it we've done it in in China with what's now known as Cystic we've done it in Europe and we're still looking for a clever, you know, <laughs> brand for that, but we call it ECEE. -E. So, you know, we've done joint meetings in Europe with other organizations. So we've done so much of this work, and um, it was almost, you know, unwittingly, not consciously, you know, part of uh, the role of, of the executive director that, you know, I fell into just to try and uh, build these uh, collaborations, but an important one. I, maybe the most enjoyable thing that, you know, I've... I've done, uh, you know, as executive director of the organization, is to try and build these collaborations and see where they can lead, you know, programmatically. You know, what can we do uh, successfully together? You know, and I, and I feel good about that because it gave, you know, all kidding aside about, you know, the challenges working with different cultures that Bruno explained to me. You have that not just in Europe, you have that everywhere. And, you know, just learning uh, the cultures of these people, learning how these other organizations functions uh, has been just a, a uh, you know, I, I feel very fortunate again to be uh, have had this role for the society, and I feel really good about what we've been able to uh, get from them. Well, so I was going to ask you, how, how do you think that this international melting pot that you build that you're building, how do you think that changed the society? Well, you asked me earlier about you know the growth uh, in, in international participation, and I, I believe it. There's no question, you know, it's it's helped that with that uh, but uh, you know also uh, the the leadership uh, we have uh, a much more diverse leadership and that's that's fantastic for our our growth and development because you get those perspectives to have a voice in the organization and I don't think it would have happened at least not at the level at it that it has happened had we not you know gone into these uh, the collaborative type of programs and really engaged at a higher level people from different parts of the world Let's talk about students for a minute. Mm. Um, student chapters, student <coughs> travel grants, students, even the student mixer, student poster session, they all came into being under your watch. Uh, I, and I know for a fact from talking to some of your colleagues that student chapters was a, a pet project. I don't know if that's fair to say, but that st we have student chapters today in ECS because you made that happen. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, I, I have to, you know, give a lot of credit to one of our long-range planning committees who uh, one of their emphasis of, uh, they, they usually would come out uh, of a, a long-range planning cycle with three to five 
key priorities, and, and this was a group that came out of one with students. And, and a lot of the things you just said were ideas that came from this group. The problem being, I mean, there's two sort of. You have you have some sort of structural challenges. You know, how do you integrate the, the student programming, and and then of course, how do you pay for that integration? Because up until that time, there was no student involvement in the meetings or in publications. Is that not really. I mean, not not to the level that we're doing now. You know, we had student authors and we had student meeting attendees and student presenters, but it, it's the the opportunities. You know. Uh, we just didn't create enough of those of those types of things, and so and we had to be proactive about it. I mean, that was the whole point. That's what the long range planning committee was making observations about, and so um, I mean, specifically to the student chapters, you know, uh, this was a, a hanging idea that then came to fruition because somebody made a request for a student chapter, and and so it, you know, considering that we had a long range planning committee whose now report was collecting dust somewhere, had said, well, this is a pretty good idea. Um, I was able to use that and said, well, let's come, and now we have a request, let's put a, a guideline together. And so we got a few of the bright minds in the society and we put a structure in and, and an approval process and all the things you do and, and had to assign staff to figure out how to support uh, the, these things. And, um, and so we, we started a, a student chapter network that, much to my surprise, has grown to, I think is going to get to over 70 this year. It's just, it's, the, the growth is phenomenal. Uh, and um, I, I just didn't envision that there would be this level of interest. I thought there might be a, we had a few hot spots where we could do a better job interacting with the students, and I thought that's what it would be. And I, I knew somehow or another you needed a, a structure, uh, an enterprise within the organization that created this opportunity for a student to engage, right? Much more so than just strictly through our standard programs, right? Uh, uh, something more dedicated to just what they're doing. And thus the chapter. Uh, and obviously there was a need. And what do you think effect it's had as far as getting the students involved? Well, so our student membership uh, and participation has grown uh, across all areas. And I, I think that's, that's the number one effect. And, you know, they're still new enough to not even um, fully appreciate what it might have effect as these, you know, the, the generation matures, right, and becomes more prominent scientists in the field, that we touch them early on, you know, gives me, you know, hope <laughs> and expectation, I say, that they will, you know, will be active participants and support our organization and have some appreciation of their initial, their initial role as a student member of a chapter. Well, you know, some of the people that you've interviewed on this master series, the, the older men and women, talk about their first meeting and how some mentor of theirs shoved mm -hmm. them into it and that's like one of their best memories yeah. of having done that and and this is even you know bigger than that one person right. one meeting uh, do you think that'll have a long-term effect I do uh, yeah I think those touch points are critical and I don't think they're uh, you know the world has changed a lot and um, and so I, th I think there's more of a need is where I'm going with that. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that that kind of mentoring and direction, you know, at, uh, at the university level from the faculty occurs in the way it did when I started. So there was, there was, a, there was a big void, a big, a big need to create this, uh, the, the student chapter entity, you know, to create that touch point and connection so they get pushed into the organization. Now we talked a little bit about publishing earlier, but let's talk about some of the controversy, I guess, with the publishing. So scientific publishing has changed over the time you've been in, involved with ECS. Tell us a little bit for those that wouldn't know about how, how it's changed, just to, mm -hmm. so people have a background. And then I want to talk about, you know, what ECS's response has been. Well, I said, you know, earlier that there's a, a, there's a publishing revolution. And, yeah, and I, I say that only because the, the change has been so significant. And a lot of it has to do with the technology that I also described earlier. And so now, you know, uh, we get to this point, And what you have uh, out there in, in the publishing world is, is dominance by uh, commercial publishers who really own the market and do most of the uh, content dissemination, as, you know, particularly from the uh, the, the, the elite journals, or all the journals, I should say, in, in science and, and medicine, they have such a great uh, large percentage of, of the market. And so, it, you know, one of the, the fundamental things that's different is that uh, I believe organizations like ECS have a stewardship role. And, and so that, that role is very important in, just in terms of 
of controlling you know, what it costs, who can access, who can publish, uh, the quality and editorial review of the, of the content, all those, all those things are, are part of what the steward of that science does. And, and a lot of that now uh, role has been designated to the commercial enterprise. And, and they have, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, um, inhibited broader dissemination, which is, again, is um, the function of this society uh, by pricing it at extremely high prices, by bundling it together and selling it so that you, you, you stifle the access uh, and strain the budgets. Uh, and you know, in the case uh, of, of the larger commercial publishers, you know, pulling 35 to 40 percent profits from the system of research that's basically given to them by a free raw material called a, a research manuscript. And so there's, there's just something wrong about that, uh, just if you look at what we're supposed to be doing uh, as an organization. And that's really the, the state of where things are at now, so we've taken a position to, to continue our stewardship role. And so let's talk about that. So that, that manifested itself as free the science. Correct. So it, it, now we talked about Digital, going digital being a, having a huge effect on the society and probably one of the most important things that happened in your time here. Rate free the science and, and open access as far as that. And maybe just a little definition of what free the science is so people that aren't familiar will know what we're talking about. Right. Well, uh, the first thing is uh, we we had to give a name to it, and you know, and and free the science is, is sort of catchy because uh, it might not have a a real clear meaning, but it's really a pretty simple premise. Uh, you know, we as an organization whose mission it is to disseminate research, uh, to advance our science, felt that the freedom of this information, the accessibility of this information is, is key to the success and accomplishing what we're supposed to do with our mission. So, uh, so Free the Science is, um, is an initiative with the ultimate goal is to get to the moon, <laughs> meaning uh, have all the information available in a digital library freely available to our entire community, to the public in general. Uh, whoever wants to use it, uh, read it and use it. And, um, and that, that's ultimately what we'd like to ac accomplish. And we're well on our way to creating more and more open uh, science in, in our digital library. And so, uh, tell me the level of importance you think to the organization of, of Free the Science, the Free the Science Initiative. Well, uh, you know, I think <laughs> there, a lot of the things that we do uh, are, are very important, and I, I, I hate to make a judgment about that. You know, it, you know, I mean, the, the, the membership function, the, the community function, the, the meeting function is so critical. I think the recognition function that we serve is very important to careers and advancement of science. But, uh, you know, again, at, at, at the baseline of everything is, is our ability to distribute or disseminate. And, and, um, and so there's been nothing more important than this and more closely aligned with what we're trying to do from a mission standpoint. And, and also, um, you know, what, what we have accomplished so far, where we see it it's going, it, you know, that to me puts a degree of importance on it because we're so much better at disseminating the research, which means logically that uh, we're so much better at advancing the science. Again, what we're here for. How responsible do you feel to carry on this 116 year now plus year old electrochemical society, the, the traditions? How, how, like, do you think about that when you're going to sleep at night? Sure. It's, uh, you know, I have great appreciation for what this organization has uh, accomplished, what it has represented for a long time. Um, you know, the, the position that I have is described as servant leadership. I mean, I'm here to provide that, that service, and, and, and so they've entrusted with me um, the responsibility to ensure that you know, we, we go on and that the mission uh, is accomplished. And, and that, you know, it, it's, um, it's quite a re responsibility. I wouldn't say, you know, it uh, gives me uh, sleepless nights, but you know, maybe every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know from being around you that, that you're, you're a, a walking encyclopedia of near history and far history. Like anything that comes up, you can, you can name names, you can name places, you can name dates which just shows a lot of respect for uh, the history of this society, I think. Where do you think ECS goes from here? 
we're talking to you at the, the end of your mm -hmm. time as as uh, executive director. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you see? Well, so many of these things we've already talked about, but uh, you know uh, the the importance and the relevance of the science and engineering discipline has become. Uh, well, it's become so relevant and, and so important, and there's so many implications on so many, many, many uh, challenging things that are going around in the world. So I think there, there's a bright future for the discipline. And I think as a, an organization that serves that discipline, there's a, there's a bright future for ECS. And uh, I, I think there's, there's many challenges uh, to be, su be successful, to, you know, for, to, su to sustain what we're doing. Uh, but uh, there's many opportunities, and uh, and there's, uh, as I said, it's it's important for us to grab hold of those opportunities and continue the the role and what we've done. Do you think ECS has changed you in any way? I mean, this is what you've done your whole adult mm -hmm. life, pretty much. How do you think it's affected you? In the I'm sure it's affected me quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, well, I mean, starting with. Uh, you know, my appreciation for the science. I, I, I was going to say my appreciation and understanding of the science, but I won't go quite that far. <laughs> <laughs> but my appreciation and for the people. Uh, and, and um, you know, it's, it's one of the, the, the motivations I have is, is knowing, you know, some of the, the scientists, some of the great ones, but some of that aren't as well known and, and how, uh, how important their work is and how important it is to them and, and, and how they apply themselves to it. And, you know, you can, you can see that at our meetings. I can, I can feel that in the people that are involved in our publishing. And, you know, it's, it's just a really good feeling. And, and so it's a, just a level of respect that I've, I've gained over time. And, you know, another thing I would be remiss if I didn't say is that um, I, I feel, you know, that for me, um, very grateful is the way to put it that I fell into uh, a position where I work for an organization who uh, is you know here to try and make the world a better place and that I can I can help serve that purpose uh, you know when you start out as a business major especially in the 80s you know Michael Milken and Wall Street and all that action was going on you know you're thinking about making money and you know making a name for yourself whatever you're thinking about I don't know younger and you don't have as much appreciation for um, you know the the job experience or the meaning of the work that you're doing and uh, this work has very great meaning is it um, difficult at this point to move on or hasn't it hit you yet I think both <laughs> It's difficult to move on, but I'm, uh, but I'm very comfortable that it was time, uh, and it is time, and uh, that I've contributed, you know, what I can, and I should, you know, uh, move forward onto other things, both for myself and for the organization, and you know, and because it's been such a great journey, um, I'm not sure it will really hit me until you know the journey is final and complete here. Well, thank you, Rocky. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. And I appreciate my four years with you. It's been wonderful. Well, you're welcome.